You're listening to the Unwritable Rant Podcast with your host and bourbon soak storyteller, Juliet Miranda. Hey there, y'all. It's Juliet Miranda, and welcome to episode 237 of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. My bourbon soak story for you is about a noisy beacon and reckoning a bully. But first, I'm having a shot of bourbon. Cheers, y'all. <laughs> it's only 11 in the morning, but that's all right. It's always a good time for bourbon. So here is the latest lesson I have learned about life in the French Quarter. Getting anything delivered here, and I mean anything, mail, takeout food, crap from Amazon, it's a massive challenge. I mean, complete <laughs> clusterfuck, both for you know me and the delivery guy. And this is because nothing is easy in New Orleans. Now, for us, it has to do with the fact that we have no front door buzzer. It stopped functioning sometime in the 70s, and fixing it requires tearing down our kitchen wall, which our building manager is a little understandably reluctant to do. Now, we're fortunate in that we share a physical street address with a store. And we can rely on their good nature to receive our packages and not run away with them. Of course, that's only dependent on them actually being open. Because for most stores here, things like operating hours are more like suggestions than rules. But like I said, we're lucky. Most residents here, not so much. They're forced to tape a series of delivery instructions to their front doors and gates. And all of them read like conjuration spells. It's crazy. (laughs) They say things like, please go through the courtyard to the carriage house and then knock four times on the third window and wait for a signal. It is amazing that anything gets delivered here. Although I got to say for as hard as it is to, you know, get packages, I'm constantly amazed at how easy it is for people to find me no matter where I am. The fucking internet is a blessing and a curse. And I'll tell you, this podcast does not help. (laughs) It just acts as a noisy beacon for all the wackos, weirdos, and wonder freaks out there who are just waiting for an excuse to reach out. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, not everyone who gets in touch is a weirdo. Plenty of people are reasonably normal. And then there are people like Macy. Her email was waiting for me one morning just a couple of weeks ago, and the second I saw her name in bold at the top of my inbox, I shuddered. I mean, just every part of my being recoiled because of all of the people from my past, and I'm talking every shithead boyfriend, every rotten chick that I've known, Macy is the absolute last so-called human being on this planet that I would ever want to hear from. Decades have passed since I last saw Macy, but that doesn't mean I haven't thought about her. People like Macy are just hard to shake, even when you're an adult. I first met Macy when I was a teenager. She was another rock chick, just like me, who spent most of her Friday and Saturday nights at an all-ages show hosted by her local rock club. This place was the stomping ground for every Chicago band. Whether they'd nailed a coveted record deal or were hovering just shy of the middle, not that it mattered to any of us kids. Really, all of these bands were rock stars in our eyes, and we were just happy to have access. Well, some of us had more access than others. Me, I got backstage because I could get these guys press. Nothing huge then, just small articles and regional papers, but it was more than enough to give me the groupie equivalent of a golden ticket. Macy, well, she got backstage because she was easy. The kind of easy that bands like Motley Crue wrote songs about and roadies brag about. Why she was like that is anyone's guess. I'm sure many would speculate that she was trying to compensate for something, and who knows, maybe they're right. What I can say is that Macy owned it. She knew exactly what she was doing and did not spend any time crying in the bathroom over it. 
And quite honestly, at the time, many of us had a hesitant admiration for her. Personally, I fucking loved the chick. I did. Although we were both 15, her confidence gave her an air of maturity well beyond my own. She was street smart and scrappy. She knew all of the best vintage stores and could talk her way in or out of any situation. Most of the time, she and I were the only underage girls allowed backstage, which was how we became friends. Or at least, as much of friends as we could be. Because my parents, (laughs) they were not as enamored with Macy as I was. In my infinite teenage wisdom, I accused them of being biased, of judging Macy because she had to take the bus to get around and didn't go to the same fancy suburban high school as I did. The truth was, they saw Macy for exactly what she was. But they also understood that was something I was going to have to figure out on my own. Lord knows I would never believe them. All they could do was try to mitigate the inevitable fallout of association by setting what they hoped were a few boundaries. It would have been impossible to outright forbid me from seeing Macy. Instead, they limited how I could see her. At the club, totally fine. But if I wanted to spend any time with her outside of the club, it would have to be at my house. My parents were very, very big on home court advantage. Now, looking back, I can see that this was a reasonable compromise. They got some semblance of control, and I got a modicum of freedom. It's just that in this situation, we all underestimated Macy's aptitude for trouble. She usually came over on Sundays so that she and I could compare notes about the previous night's concerts. We'd rate the band guys on looks and skills, gossip, and Macy would share all of the racy details about whomever she'd hooked up with. Talking with her was a little like having very one-sided phone sex. She never missed a single lick, kiss, or grope, and God, did I suck it all up. But it wasn't the sex that intrigued me so much. What I wanted to know was how to get to the sex. Several dozen musicians hovered just shy of my grabby little hands, and all of them were happy to hug, but seemingly uninterested in more. Macy laughed when I asked her how the hell I could change that, and told me that my problem was flirting. She said, look, I've seen you with these guys and you're all business with your interviews and your tape recorder and whatever. You just gotta loosen up. The only problem was that I didn't quite know how. The interviews were both my in and my crutch. Without them, I had no idea what to say to these dudes. The truth is, y'all, I may come off today as being mouthy and brash, but I am terrible at casual conversation, and I always have been. Macy's solution was shockingly sensible. She told me I needed to practice. And this is how I was introduced to the questionable business of teen party lines. Oh, y'all, I don't know if you're familiar with these. Oh, they were the internet chat rooms of the 80s and eventually the stuff of many, many lawsuits. You'd find them advertised during after-school specials. All you had to do was dial a seemingly local number, and you would be connected to dozens of other teens via a party line. Macy sold me on it as being a great way to talk to guys that I would never have to meet. All the guys I wanted, no commitment, and total control. What wasn't to like? So every Sunday, we would plug my parents' phone into the extra jack in my bedroom and call in to the teen party line together. There were always people on the line, so much so that the calls occasionally sounded like a noisy cafeteria, but it was never hard to find guys to talk to. And no, they weren't all predators. I mean, yeah, I'm sure there were plenty of them in there, but as far as I know, I never talked to any. Mostly, it was just a bunch of lonely kids in small towns looking for something to do and someone to listen to them. 
and Macy would encourage me to flirt. It didn't take long to get, you know, kind of good at it. Not that flirting on a teen party line is all that challenging. It pretty much just meant hearing some guy boast about how much he can bench press and me offering a witty comeback like, oh, I bet you could bench press me. (laughs) So horrible. (laughs) But it was satisfying nonetheless, and it really was good practice on having conversations. After 20 minutes or so of flirty chatter, Macy would hang up her phone, give me a thumbs up, and she'd venture off under the guise of going to the bathroom or grabbing a snack. And I never once thought to question it. She was never gone long, just long enough. Sometimes she'd come back and get on the phone with me, but mostly she'd just thumb through a magazine and wait for me to finish. This went on for about a month. And during that time, Macy's attitude started to shift from encouraging to impatient. My bedroom started to feel like a call center every Sunday. There was no talking to each other like we used to, just to others on the party line. Macy was always so eager to dial in. I really kind of thought there was a guy in there that she liked. Little phone couples were always forming and making appointments to meet on the line at certain times, but. Macy started kind of ducking out of the calls after a few minutes and vanishing while I made the verbal rounds. Our hangout would then end abruptly, and Macy would be heading for the front door, sometimes even before I hung up the phone. Not surprisingly to everyone but me, it was around this time when things started to disappear from the house. At first it was small things bottle of hairspray, a pair of sunglasses, my favorite t-shirt. It was all stuff that was easy to misplace or leave behind. But the losses began to multiply, and they were soon less explainable, like when a bottle of cognac and one of my mom's diamond earrings went missing. My parents were careful to not make any outright accusations. I mean, they didn't really have any real proof that Macy took them but they did have proof of her being a manipulative little jerk. They had our phone bill and 300 fucking dollars worth of charges from 5515. Oh, Jesus. You know, the thing that they didn't tell you in the commercials for 5515 is that it cost about a buck a minute. Yeah. (laughs) I promptly lost my phone and weekend privileges for the next two months along with any hope of ever seeing Macy again. Like any good teen, I accepted my punishment with a complete lack of grace and decorum. Because how dare my parents not understand how crucial these teen party line calls were to my very being. And to insinuate that Macy was somehow a bad influence? Well, that was just unacceptable. I really, really wanted to believe Macy was on my side, that she'd only introduced me to the teen party line as a way to help me build confidence, you know, as a friend would. Doubt, though, is a brutal force, and I knew I could never live with myself until I knew the truth about her. So I fabricated a school function, scored a ride, and made my way to the next all-ages show to confront Macy. As usual, she was holding court in the backstage dressing room. She has a beer in one hand and some guy's cock in the other, and looks just a little surprised to see me walk into the room. Being grounded had taken me away from the scene, but not as out of it as she apparently would have liked. The band all gets up to greet me, and what do you know? Suddenly, I've got flirting game. My skills weren't perfect, but For the first time, I didn't feel the need to hide behind my tape recorder, and everyone noticed, including Macy. The guy whose cock had been in her hand is now shaking her off and heading my way, asking, gosh, what's so different about you, Juliet? And me, saying, oh, baby, the only difference is that I'm so happy to see you. I know, I was fucking horrid, I was, but... I gotta admit, it felt pretty goddamn good to be in some semblance of control. 
Too bad it didn't last. Now, let me be clear. My intention was not to make a scene with Macy. I wasn't even going to accuse her of anything. I just wanted to talk to her. So it is a huge shock to me when she stands up to grab my arm and pull me into the bathroom. This is the first of what would be many bathroom confrontations over the course of my life. Where guys duke things out sensibly in alleys and parking lots, girls use the bathroom for their malicious, dirty work. Macy locks the door behind us and she asks, Just what the fuck do you think you were doing back there? Well, I wasn't doing anything, just using the skills that she helped me acquire so that I could do better with the guys. I guess that teen party line was more socially effective than she anticipated. Because Macy says, Look, This is my turf. You want to play writer, go do it somewhere else. As she talks, her jacket falls open, and I see that she is wearing the very same t-shirt I thought I had lost. And just seeing that there, I mean, seeing my own shirt on her body, it's weird, y'all, because I recognized it as my own, but I still couldn't wrap my head around the fact that she had stolen it. Who does stuff like that? So I just look at her and I ask, why would you take my stuff? And you know what she said? That girl told me, you made it easy. And then she laughed. Ugh, fucking girls, you know, we always know how to strike where it will hurt the most. But not that I knew it then, but my biggest weakness has always been loyalty. I will stick with someone far beyond the point of reason or well-being when I enjoy their company. With Macy, I liked her. I liked hanging out with her, and I had hoped she'd felt the same way about me. I don't know. I guess I've always just had a thing for villains. So it really did kind of hurt to realize that Macy did not give a flying fuck about me. To her, I was nothing more than a mini-mart to rip off. There's not a whole lot I can do or say in this situation, so I just brush past her toward the door, not trusting myself to say anything without sounding like a wounded kitten. But Macy isn't ready to let me leave just yet. She catches my arm and pinches my shoulder like a fucking mousetrap, and she says, don't even think about telling anyone about this. You stay away from here, or I will make your life a living hell. Never have I been so happy to return home to be grounded. I think I needed that time to kind of regroup. And my parents never questioned my change of attitude, but I suspect they believed Macy and I had had our reckoning. The thing is, though, we really didn't. Because I eventually did return to the rock club to resume my place backstage and working with the bands. I didn't want to let her scare me away from something that I loved. Unfortunately, just as promised, Macy worked very, very hard to make my life hell. There were only two weapons at her disposal, word of mouth and sex, and, well, Macy knew how to use both. She started holding band guys hostage in the broom closet or, you know, wherever, so that they would miss their interviews with me. They would then later emerge seconds before showtime, zipping up their pants and high-fiving their buddies while Macy would wipe her mouth off and smile at me like a fucking praying mantis. And then there were the phone calls. I doubt a day went by for more than a year that we didn't receive at least one phone call from someone who would gleefully inform whoever answered, whether that was my parents, my little sister, my grandmother. Yet they'd tell them that I was a raging slut who only got interviews by fucking the band. I'm also pretty confident that Macy was the one who started the near crippling rumor that I'd fucked Ozzy Osbourne. It wouldn't have been hard for Macy to do, considering the overlap in people we knew and just how fast a juicy rumor can spread. And I'll tell you, this one was so pervasive, it reached not just my teachers and my guidance counselor, but my fucking mother's garden club. I don't even know how to tell you how much all of this sucked. I mean, it was humiliating and belittling. 
And the fact that Macy was jealous and insecure really did not comfort me, especially when she was the one doing the sleeping around and never taking any heat for it. My real friends encouraged me to dish out rumors, maybe wage my own name-calling campaign in retaliation. But I didn't know what that would accomplish. I mean, how would that have made me a better person? It just would have been words, and I'll tell you, even then, I firmly believed that people just do not know when to zip it. (laughs) You know, just shut your fucking mouth once in a while. (laughs) And I'll tell you, much like that pricey bottle of my parents' cognac, Macy also eventually vanished. Until recently. Her email was unexpected and unwelcome, and quite honestly, I was tempted to delete it without ever reading it. Morbid curiosity got the best of me, though. The email opened with the typical, oh my god, it's been so long, so much has happened. Apparently, Macy has thought of me often and was surprised to learn I'm living in New Orleans when she's living in Baton Rouge now. She didn't really go into any detail about her life beyond that, but she did conclude by suggesting we meet for lunch when she was in town for business. Yeah, I can only begin to imagine what kind of business Macy would have in New Orleans. Holding up a gas station, perhaps? Drowning puppies in the Mississippi? I showed the email to my guy, who immediately thinks I should have lunch with her. Maybe she's changed, he said. I don't know. But what would you do? Would you meet your former bully for lunch as an adult? It was a weird kind of situation to be in. The fact that Macy had, for whatever reason, been thinking about me got me wondering. Maybe she felt bad about what happened. Or maybe the fog of time made her memories far more rosy than real. Either way, I knew the one thing I did not want was to spend the rest of my life wondering about her. I decided to say yes to the lunch. We met at a bistro at the far edges of the quarter. My turf, my terms, and Lord knows I wasn't about to let her drag me into the bathroom. Y'all, you have no idea how obscenely nervous I felt walking into that restaurant. I mean, this chick had terrorized me for years, and now I am deliberately going to spend time with her? I kept asking myself, what the fuck am I doing? I very nearly turned back. I did especially when I saw her sitting at a table looking almost exactly as I remembered her. Except this time she wasn't wearing anything that belonged to me. She waves when she spots me at the door and runs up to give me a really, really tight hug. And for a second, it's as though we're just two teens in my bedroom squealing over rock stars again. I return her hug with somewhat less enthusiasm, and I follow her to the table. She's already ordered me a bourbon and ginger beer, and slyly admits that she's been following my career for a while. Which is slightly alarming, but I accept the cocktail anyway. Macy chats brightly over our lunch, telling me about how she's followed some band to Europe for a while, got married, then divorced, and finally got her shit together and went to business school. Apparently now she's working in sales. The conversation is so lacking in grist, I start to feel a little stupid for having been so nervous earlier. Maybe my guy was right. Maybe Macy had changed. Another round of cocktails arrives, and Macy asks a few questions about my life before landing on the subject of booze. And more specifically, bars. And this is where the Macy I used to know makes her return. Because it turns out she isn't just working in sales. She's working for a liquor distributor, hawking shitty hard cider to all of the South, and she wanted my help to get past the gatekeepers at a few French Quarter bars. Really? (laughs) Look, I wasn't so naive to think that we would walk away from this lunch being besties, but come on! She wants my help? Two cocktails and a bowl of gumbo are not restitution for time spent in hell. 
Macy takes my dead stare as an answer, and her head falls backwards as she rolls her eyes, and she says, Ugh, you're not still hung up on all that kid stuff, are you? God, you were so easy to mess with. There it is. There's that knife, stabbing me where she knows it will hurt the most. And you know what? Maybe I was easy back then. I was a kid. I was a kid who looked up to her. But that is not me anymore. And it was about fucking time she knew that. So I stand up and I say, well, it is nice to see you haven't changed, Macy. Good luck with all that. I drop a 20 on the table for my lunch and I walk away. Now, I know, I know this is definitely not the reckoning that you would expect. And it's definitely not the reckoning that I had fantasized about. I admit, the teenager in me kind of wishes I'd let her had it. Maybe spewed a few of the horrible names I had sitting on my lips. But here's why I didn't do that. It would have made me the bully. And I didn't want that. Sometimes, the best thing you can do is just walk away. Besides, Macy has her own problems. I highly doubt she's going to have a whole lot of luck selling her shitty hard cider around town. What can I say? She's going to have to find out the hard way that, like me, New Orleans is not easy. Cheers, y'all. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Unwritable Rant Podcast. Now, one thing before I let y'all go. I don't often get up on a soapbox about things, but I did want to let you know that October is National Bullying Prevention Month. I highly recommend checking out the Stomp Out Bullying Organization. It is the leading national nonprofit organization dedicated to changing the culture for all students. They work to reduce and prevent bullying, cyberbullying, and other digital abuse, and they offer educational programs to make sure that kids know how to handle things. It's an education service. It's a great resource. You can go to stompoutbullying.org. You can learn how to get help from them or ways that you can offer your own help. And that's enough out of me, y'all. Don't forget, go to theunwritablerant.com. You can check out all of the back episodes of this podcast, as well as clicking on that little buy me a drink icon to keep me in booze and you in boozy stories. Hope y'all have a great week. I will be back next Sunday to chat with y'all some more. Cheers. Go to the unwritablerant.com and sign up to get early access to interviews and new videos. And don't forget to connect with Juliet on Twitter at Morning Neurosis. Girl, you as pretty as a Sunday morning, standing on the corner at Carondelet. What you say we make our way up to Bourbon, a couple hurricanes and a hand grenade and get blown away. Let the chips fall where they may. It's all the same What you say, bon ton Hey, pretty mama, I can smell the gumbo Sweetest taste of honeysuckle on my lips Good God Almighty, I can hear the trombone Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this Come a little closer, honey, let me hold you Nothing tastes better than a bourbon kiss You can be the flower on my magnolia Every heart ought to be to a rhythm like this